Hey everyone, welcome to the next lecture in Introduction to Political Science. Today we're going to talk about uh, mainly the Constitution and a little bit about uh, the courts. So today's reading um, comes from Chapter 12 in the course textbook. Um, so what are we talking about when we're, we say constitutional government? Um, sometimes when you hear a discussion of different countries, um, you'll hear um, it's not really a democracy, it's a constitutional government. Uh, what, what does that mean? Uh, or a constitutional monarchy, uh, you may have heard um, used. So liberal democracy is based on the perspective that there should be limits on the power and scope of government, that government should abide by the rule of law, and that the rights of people should be protected from arbitrary action by government. So remember when we talked about uh, liberal democracy, we said that there's certain things that separate liberal democracy from other forms of democracy. And one of them is the idea that uh, there should be limits on the exercise of power by the government, right? So there's some things the government's allowed to do, but there are limits on what those things are, right? So even though democ democratic government is representing the people, um, we still want to place limitations on what they can do so that as individuals, we have the most choice about how we want to live our lives free from government interference. So in other words, liberal democracy is characterized not only by government elected by the people, but also by a constitutional government. And this means a government that uh, consistently acts in accordance with established fundamental rules and principles, right? So this means when we're talking constitutional government, that there's a certain set of rules that uh, those in government have to follow. Uh, so, uh, and, or certain principles that they have to follow. So they're, they're not unlimited in their power. It's not that we elect, you know, our MPs and then they choose the prime minister uh, and, uh, and they have carte blanche to do whatever they want uh, in terms of passing laws um, until the next election when the next government comes in. Um, they have considerable power to pass different laws, but the laws that they are allowed to pass um, and the way in which they do so um, and who is responsible for passing laws and for different functions of government, um, there are certain rules about that. And, the parliament cannot overrule these rules. So in, in, a, uh, in a government like Canada, um, parliament actually is not the utmost authority. It's not the highest authority in the country. Uh, neither are the provinces, neither are the courts. The highest authority in, or the monarch, um, or the governor general. Uh, in, a, in a country like Canada, the highest authority would actually be the constitution. So those established fundamental rules and principles is, are the highest authority in the land. So what is a constitution then? Uh, a constitution is the fundamental rules and principles by which the state is governed. Um, it determines which institutions have the authority to make laws and governing decisions and the relationship among, among those institutions. So how are they related to different institutions of government, so the executive, the, uh, uh, the legislature, um, the courts, how are they, uh, how are they related? Um, for example, in many countries, the courts um, are able to um, strike down laws of parliament if they violate the law, if they violate the constitution. So that's a function that sometimes uh, will be given to the courts. Um, there's different functions for uh, laid out in terms of these are the functions that are done by the executive, these are the functions done by the parliament, these are the functions done by the court. Um, and then in what area are any of them allowed? There's certain things, there's certain uh, laws uh, or certain principles um, that none of them are allowed to break or can only break under certain um, circumstances. Um, a constitution also lays out the basic relationships between government and the people, including rights and freedoms, right? So big, large areas where um, there are limitations placed on government are in terms of infringing on rights and freedoms of individuals. Um, we'll return to it later. Uh, these rights and freedoms are not absolute. But in general, as little as possible, government um, is, uh, is supposed to, you know, take any action um, that would violate these rights and freedoms. Codified constitution, a formal constitution that establishes the major constitutional pro uh, provisions. 
Um, so this would be kind of a constitutional document. Uh, in most countries, uh, most democracies would have one of these, most liberal democracies would have one of these. Um, and so this is the written constitution that sets out the rules and principles, right? So what, are, uh, what does each branch of government, uh, what powers do they have and how are they interrelated and how does the government and these different institutions relate to the people? This is formalized in a particular document. There are also what we refer to though as constitutional conventions. These are fundamental principles that are followed even though they're not contained in the le uh, legal document. Um, so these are practices that are written down nowhere necessarily other than maybe in textbooks that have been studying them, but they're not written, they're not codified in the constitution, they're not codified in law, but they're pr based on practice. Um, so it's something that um, the government has been doing by convention for decades, for centuries, um, in, in certain cases. Um, and this can eventually, um, in the judgment of the different branches of government and the courts that are interpreting it, interpreting it take on kind of the st uh, status of a constitutional convention. So even though it's not written down that this is the way things must be done, um, it's by practice has been established as a fundamental principle um, and so it will carry the weight of that. Um, so not everything that we would consider kind of a constitutional principle is written down. Some, um, most are, but some uh, are established kind of through practice. The Canadian constitution uh, can be uh, considered as a variety of different elements. So um, originally would be the Constitutional Act of 1867. Um, it's a core written element of the Constitution. Um, so this was when Canada first um, had Confederation became a country um, for the first time. Still some limitations back in 1867 um, on, um, on certain functions uh, where we didn't have independence from uh, the UK. But on domestic politics, for the large part, this set Canada out as, as a country with the ability to set domestic politics. The Constitutional Act 1982 made the Constitution fully Canadian, so it removed kind of any formal last ties to uh, to the UK in terms of uh, our Constitution, in terms of our laws, in terms of our courts. Uh, no longer were any um, with the UK. Um, even the monarch, um, who we would interpret as being, you know, the uh, uh, the monarch being the queen at this point, and we would typically think of her as the Queen of England, but when in dealing with Canada, she's the Queen of Canada. And yes, she is the Queen of England as well, but those are separate titles. In fact, Canada and the UK could even establish different succession rules where, um, where one would have, um, after the Queen passes, one would have a particular person be the next monarch and uh, Canada uh, would have a different person. That would be in theory possible, it'd be confusing, but it would be possible. Um, so although uh, uh, we think of her as being, uh, she's you know the queen of Canada because she's the queen of England, um, through the Constitution Act 1982 really, she's the queen of Canada when dealing with Canada and that's independent from being the queen of England. Um, it also added the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and established procedures for constitutional amendment. Constitutional amendment beforehand um, was something that was rather complicated given kind of the ties with um, the UK as well. Um, so now there's a kind of a, a formalized established procedure for constitutional amendment. And the addition of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in terms of um, protecting the individual rights and freedoms and putting that within the constitution. Remember constitutional document, one of the functions is to um, set out how the government interacts with the people in terms of protecting rights and freedoms. Um, in the Constitutional Act 19, uh, 1867, not to say there was no protection from individual rights and freedoms, but it was less codified, less detailed um, than we would like. So there's the addition of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in 1982, um, something similar to what you might think of in the US context of the Bill of Rights to protect the rights of individuals. Um, we can also think of other legislative statutes can be considered constitutional due to their importance. So there are certain things that aren't included in the constitution that, but that were passed by parliament. 
um, that have become so important, so kind of entrenched in the very um, nature of us as a country that they um, kind of take on semi-constitutional status. Um, so they are fu fully binding on other governments or successive governments. Uh, so things like, for example, the Canada Election Act. And then finally, constitutional conventions, uh, such as the Canadian Prime Minister requiring the confidence of the legislature in order to remain in office. So this is something that actually is not found in the Constitution. It's not formalized anywhere, um, but it would create a crisis if um, it did happen. So for example, on uh, requiring confidence in the legislature means that on certain votes that are key votes, um, uh, they're considered confident votes. Um, if the prime minister loses one of these votes, um, then they're required to uh, seek an election or at least go to the governor general about uh, seeing this um, kind of resigning as prime minister calling an election or the governor general may decide to ask another group in parliament to try forming a government. Um, but um, the prime minister is, is, uh, uh, cannot remain in office um, if they don't have the confidence of the legislature. Now, if it goes to an election, that same prime minister can be reelected. Uh, the, uh, uh, the population could say that they have confidence in them, um, but um, they're required to at least go to the governor general and seek out these options. Uh, they can't remain in office um, at that point. Um, now, this is, like I said, isn't written anywhere, um, but this is a constitutional convention. Um, and if um, a prime minister refused to resign after one of these, um, uh, it insisted on remaining in office, this would cause a constitutional crisis um, for the country uh, because this would violate what everyone understands as the rules of the game in parliament um, and for um, and the executive for choosing a prime minister. Um, so defying it would go against the very nature of how we do things, um, how we select our prime ministers, how we go to elections, um, ways of holding prime ministers accountable. Um, so this would end up uh, causing a major disruption um, within parliament, within the provinces. Many of the provinces would be highly upset. Um, it, uh, uh, and potentially within the courts as well. Uh, and then finally, judicial bodies make decisions concerning the interpretation of the Constitution. So that's an important role for the judiciary, uh, often the, uh, the Supreme Court, when it comes into conflicts over whether a particular law um, is constitutional or not, or whether a particular action is constitutional or not. The judge of the constitutionality of something is typically the judiciary. So here's a timeline of the Canadian Constitution. So 1867, uh, the British North America Act, later renamed the Constitutional Act, uh, adopted uh, for the Union of Province of Canada, Ontario, Quebec, with Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. So it uh, took uh, the province of Canada uh, and, and uh, uh, so Quebec, Ontario, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick uh, formed the basis of, of the new country of Canada. Uh, in 1870, Manitoba was established as a province. British Columbia in 1871 and PEI in 1873 were added. Um, 1905, Saskatchewan and Alberta were created as provinces. Uh, in 1926, uh, the Imperial Conference proclaimed Canada and the British Dominions as autonomous. Um, so, uh, this is going toward one of the places where, remember I said in 1867, Canada wasn't fully autonomous on, on all uh, areas. So for example, there were certain areas, um, largely in 1867, Canada had control over domestic politics, but things like foreign policy um, were still largely left to the UK. So for example, in World War I, Canada entered World War I largely because um, the UK entered World War I. So we didn't necessarily have autonomy in deciding whether we wanted to join. 1927 uh, attempts begin to find a formula to allow the constitution to be amended in Canada. Um, so at that point, it would have required the UK for constitutional amendment. 
1931, Statute of Westminster confirmed that Canada is a sovereign country. Uh, then uh, 1949, most aspects of constitution can be amended in Canada. Supreme Court of Canada replaces the Judicial Committee of the British Privy Council as the highest court of appeal, and Newfoundland joins Canada. Um, so until 1949, the highest court in Canada wasn't a Canadian court. It was actually uh, the, uh, the Privy Council's or did, did, uh, Judicial Committee of the British Privy Council, uh, so in the House of Lords. Um, so up until 1989, if there was any major dispute, it would go through the Canadian courts, but the, the, the court kind of of last appeal, which would now be the Supreme Court, actually wasn't made up of Canadians. It was made up of, of British Lords. Um, so that's certainly something for, you know, um, that was a, 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 from a Canadian's perspective, it's nothing against the Privy Council, but um, for, uh, from a Canadian perspective, um, we would like our highest court to include Canadians. Uh, in 1960 to 1966, uh, the Quebec government seeks constitutional changes. Uh, 1967 uh, to 1971, uh, constitutional negotiations end in failure. Um, so during that period with the Quebec government seeking constitutional, constitutional changes, and there's probably many different provinces that thought that looking at the constitution would be a good idea, kind of formalizing it as a fully Canadian document would be a good idea. But constitutional debates are always very, very difficult. Um, 1976, Parti Québécois elected. Um, 1980, Quebec government requests uh, for a mandate to negotiate sovereignty association defeated in Quebec referendum. So the first referendum for, uh, for um, uh, independence or sovereignty association um, uh, is, uh, is defeated. Uh, 1982, the Constitutional Act 1982 adopted making the Constitution fully amendable in Canada and adding the Charter of Rights and Freedoms to the Constitution Act. Um, so this was an addition. So there is an amendment formula added to the existing Constitution along with um, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Um, and we've got 1987, Prime Minister and Premiers reach agreement on Meech Lake Accords. Uh, 1990, Meech Lake Accord failed to pass in Newfoundland and Manitoba legislatures. So this was another formula for constitutional amendment for updating it further, for working out um, areas where there is dissatisfaction with 1982. Um, it required um, a, a extensive negotiation because of the new formula uh, for constitutional change. It's very difficult. Um, and so it failed to get sufficient uh, support. Uh, 1992, uh, Prime Ministers, Premiers, and Aboriginal leaders reached agreement on Charlottetown Accord, Accord defeated in national referendum. Uh, so another attempt at uh, making some changes goes down in failure. 1995, uh, Quebec referendum on sovereignty uh, na uh, narrowly defeated. Um, so this was the second uh, sovereignty debate, or sorry, not debate, um, or independent vote or sovereign, uh, sovereignty vote, uh, defeated by a very small margin of, I think, 50.1 to 49.9, so extremely close vote. And then finally, in 2000, Clarity Act, uh, setting out conditions for a province to become independent passed by Parliament. So there were some questions um, in about the 1995 referendum that um, it, the, the question wasn't sufficiently clear. Um, it was a ambiguously worded independent question or sovereignty question um, who, whose real effect um, wasn't necessarily clear to a, a voter. Um, and so Parliament passed a law that if you're seeking, um, if, uh, seeking to become independent, uh, there's certain regulations on kind of, it, the question has to be clear. Um, you can't kind of have a confusing question. So some of the charges against the question being asked was that, um, for example, in the, in the 1995 referendum, was that it was ambiguous in terms of what it actually meant. Did it mean that were people were actually voting that they wanted independence? Were they voting that they wanted kind of sovereignty association? Or were they just voting that they wanted the 
Quebec government to be able to begin negotiations. So they were actually voting for it, but they wanted to let the Quebec government negotiate and see what they could get. It was unclear for, for many people what they're actually voting on among kind of these three things. And if we're dealing with something as severe as a province seceding from the country, um, it's important that everyone who's voting in a referendum on it knows what they're actually voting on, what, which of these three things. These three things are, are very different, whether it's full independence, whether it's sovereignty association, so some form of still remaining within the country, but greater kind of independence, greater autonomy, or is it just a mandate to negotiate about the possibility of one of those two things and what it would look like. Um, so this is um, the Clarity Act came in kind of trying to clarify what is required for um, referendum questions. Since 1995, there's been a few moments where um, there's been rumblings when a, a PQ government gets elected about um, another referendum. However, since 1995, particularly since 2000 in public opinion polling, um, the support in Quebec for any form of other referendum on sovereignty um, has been so low that even when Parti Québécois um, get elected, despite their support for um, independence or some form of independence, um, they haven't called a referendum knowing that um, it would be defeated and um, I, and each time it gets defeated, it gets harder and harder to call another one. At a certain point, it gets hard to say, we can't have a, another referendum every 10, 15 years uh, to see uh, what people want. Um, there is still always, there is a sm small or minority population in Quebec um, who are always supportive of um, some form of sovereignty. So whether this will resurface, if there are any tensions, if a Canadian government, if federal government becomes ever overly unpopular, um, if uh, the federal government ever does something that annoys or angers enough um, Quebecers, then it's possible that the issue that uh, reemerges, um, that popular support increases. This is always possible. Um, but for the last 20 years, um, it, uh, this hasn't really um, happened. Constitutional priv uh, provisions in governing institutions. Um, so we can analyze constitutions in terms of four basic elements. So it's a preamble usually concerning the basic values and goals of the country. Um, so this is kind of more often just, um, I wouldn't say poetic language, but more kind of just trying to set out uh, in ab more abstract terms, what are the basic values of the country? What are the goals of the country? What does it stand for? So peace, order, and good government, or uh, uh, you know, pursuit of happiness. Um, provisions concerning the institutions of government, so the second um, part, provisions concerning the institution of government, including the procedures for passing laws. So um, what are the different institutions of government? What are the powers that are given to them? What are the limits of the power that are given to them? And how are they interrelated? Then there's a provi uh, provisions establishing the rights and freedoms of the population. So how does the government relate to the people? And then finally, procedures for amending the constitution. So how can this document be changed? So in terms of the governing institutions um, for Canada, uh, or in general, typically, executive authority is formally held by the monarch, uh, which is limited by the constitution. Um, so in Canada, the executive is composed of the monarch um, at the top, the governor general who uh, represents her or him, uh, depending on the time. Um, then the prime minister and cabinet form the executive. Um, the monarch as the head of it is, um, it's severely limited by the constitution. So um, while we're a constitutional monarchy, um, the parliament um, typically has more powers. The, uh, the executive, or at least the portion of the executive for, for the monarch um, is severely constrained by the constitution um, and even more so by constitutional convention. So there are some things that according to the formal codified constitution that the monarch could do. 
but based on practice and because it would be seen as anti-democratic since the um, uh, the queen or governor general is not elected, um, there's certain uh, functions that are given to the monarch that would be uh, would cause uh, a constitutional crisis if they were to use these power by convention. The monarch abstains from using it and allows the prime minister and parliament to uh, to settle the issues. Um, the power of the executive is dependent on maintaining the support of the majority of uh, in the legislature. So remember, we talked about a prime minister, if they lose the confidence of the legislature, um, cannot make a stay in government or um, has to either seek a, um, an election or the, the governor general can allow a different portion of parliament to try forming a government. Um, but the current prime minister, current cabinet can't remain. Um, judicial institutions are expected to be independent of both the executive and legislation, uh, legislative institutions. So Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So nearly all uh, constitutions contain pr provisions protecting the rights and freedoms of individuals. The Constitutional Act of 1867 did not explicitly protect rights and freedoms, uh, assumed parliament would not infringe on liberties. Now, um, this, you know, we, we would certainly hope that even without um, protections in the Constitution, that a parliament made up of Canadians would not pass laws that infringe on the liberties of other Canadians. Um, but when it comes to something as important as our individual freedoms, um, it's probably not safe to just put it to trust or to assumption. Um, so the Constitutional Act 1982 added the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, um, which codifies um, these individual rights and gives it constitutional status. So basic provisions of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms include the following. Uh, so fun, uh, includes fundamental freedoms. So things like protection, uh, freedom of conscience and religion, freedom of opinion and expression, part of freedom of opinion and expression being like uh, freedom of speech or free press. Uh, democratic rights, so include the right of all citizens to vote and hold elective office. Um, so we can't exclude particular citizens um, from voting. Um, now, again, th this can be infringed on in certain cases. So for example, um, technically not all citizens can vote. Um, those who are under 18 aren't able to vote. Um, so there always are limitations even on these, uh, on these rights, but there has to be kind of a reasonableness to it. Uh, mobility rights, so it includes the right to move and to pursue uh, a livelihood in any province. So typically, except under extreme circumstances, we have the ability, once you, if you're a Canadian citizen, to go and um, move between provinces as you'd like. So and Ontario couldn't say, no, you can't come and get a job in Ontario. Um, so you don't have to say apply to move to a different province. Uh, legal rights. So include the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, the right to be secure against unreasonable search uh, or arbitrary detention, the right to a trial within a reasonable period of time, the right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty, and the right not to be subject to any cruel and unusual punishment. So many of these are uh, kind of the rights related to, um, to crime and punishment and the kind of the judicial process and your rights in terms of the judicial process um, if you're accused of a crime. Equality rights, so provides that every person is equal under the law and has the right to uh, equal protection and equal benefit of the law without discrimination on such grounds as race, origin, color, religion, sex, age, or mental or physical disability. Uh, and then uh, language rights, um, so includes the declaration that English and French are the official languages of Canada and New Brunswick and are given equal status in the operations of the Canadian and New Brunswick governments. Uh, so it should be noted that, um, uh, so if with the federal government, uh, uh, English and French have equal status. Um, everyone within Canada when dealing with the federal government should be able to receive services no matter where they are in the country in English and French. Um, because those are the official languages of Canada and they should be given equal status 
Um, in the provinces, New Brunswick is also formally uh, bilingual. So the official languages of New Brunswick are English and French. And so in terms of services with those provincial governments, um, you should be able to receive them in English and French no matter where you are. Um, all of the other provinces only have one official language. Um, so in Quebec, the official language is French. Um, and in all the other provinces other than New Brunswick, the official language is English. So in Quebec, the, um, there's no guarantees um, that of, uh, or no requirement to be able to receive service at, with the provincial government in English. Still, typically you can, uh, but there's no, um, there's no constitutional right um, to, uh, um, for it. Um, and in the other provinces, there's, uh, the provincial government services would typically be in English. There's still some times where you can get it in French as much as possible. Quebec government would try to cater in English and other provinces would try to cater um, in French as, as best as possible. But there's no requirement to do so, um, unlike the federal government and the New Brunswick government. Now, rights and freedoms, like I said, are not absolute. There are certain circumstances where they can be, um, uh, limitations can't be placed. Um, although certain limitations to freedoms are necessary to avoid harm, the question of how far government should go in limiting freedoms to protect people from potential harm um, is often uh, controversial. So remember, we've already had some discussions about, say, limitations to free speech and are uh, limitations to free speech appropriate in the case of hate speech um, or um, limitations on our privacy um, in terms of security. Um, so these are areas where sometimes people will say that certain limitations are acceptable because um, it will reduce a greater harm. It causes some harm in these limitations, um, but it's protecting against a greater harm. But these are always very constitu uh, controversial. Constitutional rights and freedoms have been challenged in recent years in many countries, particularly in relation to concerns about terrorism. Now, limits to rights and freedoms in the Canadian Charter. Um, so there are a couple of provisions in the Canadian Charter that kind of uh, spell out how these uh, limitations can uh, come into play. Um, so there's section one includes the reasonable limits clause of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It explicitly allows for laws to place reasonable limits on rights and freedoms, provided that the limit can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society, right? So it has to be something that is justifiable in kind of a free society. Um, it, that, so um, the, um, if we are gonna place any limitations on these fundamental freedoms, it has to be something that the government can say and justify, this is the reason we're doing it. This is something that we can justify uh, and we're, we don't lose kind of our status as an open society, as a free society by doing so. It's something that there is a strong reason, a reasonable reason for doing so. Um, so for example, some would make an argument in the case for, again, of uh, limits to privacy um, that um, in terms of uh, enhancing security, um, that's something that is reasonable to do in a free society. Um, or again, uh, hate speech laws. Um, those who advocate for hate speech laws say, yes, freedom of speech is very important, but given the harm caused by hate speech, it's reasonable in a free and, uh, and democratic society that we put some limitations on speech to be able to protect others' ability to participate in society. Then there's also section 33 of the charter um, and it allows a parliament or a provincial legislature to override some rights by using the notwithstanding clause. Uh, anytime you use a notwithstanding clause, it's only effective for five years, but it can be reenacted. So this means that without necessarily having to um, go through reasonableness, so justifying it as reasonable, um, section 33 allows to overwrite some rights um, by using the notwithstanding clause. So essentially saying, uh, doing, so if put as a notwithstanding clause, it's going to be saying, notwithstanding what is put in the constitution, we are going to do this. Uh, this was uh, a, a, an important provision for the Quebec government in negotiating the, the constitution, having the notwithstanding clause. Uh, and the Quebec government is the, um, 
the only one to have used it um, in terms of the uh, the some of the language laws in Quebec, um, particularly related to I believe it was signage. Uh, so the, the provisions that uh, French has to be prominent on signs uh, has to be larger. Um, so um, some of those laws got challenged. Um, got um, I, um, but the, the Quebec government uh, invoked the notwithstanding clause. Amending the constitution. So constitutional amendments are needed from time to time because of changing circumstances and changing values of country citizenry. However, the try to ensure that the government doesn't change the constitution to gain excessive powers or to take away protected rights. Most countries require a high level of support to change the written constitution uh, than is needed in ordinary law. So typically speaking in most countries, a change to the constitution um, or at least in a, in a federal country like Canada or the US, a change of the constitution wouldn't require a mere um, uh, vote in parliament. Uh, it would typically require kind of a vote in parliament along with um, votes in uh, provinces in support of, uh, it could be a certain number of provinces, it could be all of the provinces. Um, some countries might use a referendum so it requires an act of parliament plus a referendum receiving a certain percentage of vote. In other countries, it may be all in parliament, but rather than a majority of vote, it requires what we would call a supermajority. Um, so a larger percent, so maybe it would be two thirds, it might be 60% or it might be two thirds uh, of legislators um, have to support it. So it means that uh, it can't just be a slim majority who changed the rules of the country um, in their personal favor. Because the thresholds typically for constitutional change are so difficult to achieve, um, that has the benefits that it can't be um, it can't be kind of used for uh, a party kind of to take power to give themselves additional powers and uh, reduce the kind of democratic nature of the country. So that's a good feature. One of the um, uh, downsides. Um, is that uh, major changes can be difficult to achieve. Um, typically speaking, whenever something comes up in debates within, in, within Canada about, oh, we'd like to change this in the constitution, inevitably everyone just kind of groans and says, we don't want to touch that. Because as soon as you go to open up the constitution, you're gonna have everybody who's gonna start saying, well, I want this change, I want this change as well, I want this change as well. Um, and getting kind of a, a, a basket of changes that would get everyone's support and that would be able to pass um, is so unlikely that people just kind of groan and roll their eyes when anyone talks about amending the constitution. So that's actually potentially bad um, because we do want, yes, we want the constitution to be very difficult to change so it can't be exploited. But if society actually agrees that it needs to be updated on something, we want the ability to be able to do so. And I'd make the argument that in Canada, it's so difficult to do um, that even if it's something that, even if there was one thing that we could really look at and everyone pretty much in Canada could agree, we should change this. Anytime you talk about open up the constitution because people would try to throw so many other things in with it, it would probably likely fail so spectacularly that nobody touches it. Uh, so in Canada, the procedures adopted in 1982 for amending the Canadian constitution are complex. Um, there's many different views across English Canada, French Canada, indigenous groups, uh, different regions um, of, of the country. So uh, kind of the East first, uh, the center versus the West. Um, so many different viewpoints. With a high level of agreement needed for constitutional change, it's not surprising that major changes have been difficult to achieve. Uh, judicial activism. So. Um, Judges, remember, we talked about have the power of judicial review. So they have the authority to strike down legislation or government actions that the courts deem to be in violation of the Constitution. So if someone believes that a particular law violates the Constitution, then it goes to the courts and then up ultimately, usually it would end up at the Supreme Court. Um, and the Supreme Court um, 
would rule on whether um, this action is constitutional or not. If it's viewed as not constitutional, then the law is um, struck down um, and um, uh, something else would have to be passed. Sometimes the, uh, the judiciary will identify exactly where the problem is and what features would need to be changed for it to be a, an acceptable law. Uh, so we'll kind of give guidance to the government on how they can pass kind of the next time. So if the government kind of passes the revised version of the law, um, it was something that the court would be willing to accept. Um, sometimes they'll give that. Um, sometimes they'll try to almost write the new law um, or kind of really dictate what would need to be in the new law. Um, while the power of judicial review was not explicitly stated in the American Constitution or the Constitutional Act of 1867, courts in both countries have assumed this role. So it's actually not something that's formally spelled out in the Constitution, but it's something that by convention has been adopted. Uh, judicial activism is a term used when the courts are active in invalidating legislation and government action that are inconsistent with the Constitution. Um, so um, in any country where judicial review exists, uh, some judiciaries are much more active in, um, in validating law than others. Um, some will kind of take the perspective that uh, we want to give the legislature as much leeway in passing laws and in kind of um, in setting laws in the country as possible. Um, and so they will only invalidate laws if absolutely necessary. Uh, and then some will be much more active in terms of interpreting it, not only in terms of the constitution, but in terms of other laws or in terms of convention, uh, taking a much more kind of active view of what the constitution entails. Um, some judges will take a very conservative view about what the, what the, the constitution entails. Um, whereas others will take a much more expansive view of what the constitution uh, entails, what the provisions involves, and anything that violates kind of the, that more expanded view is something that the uh, judiciary will get involved in. Um, so some judges and, and courts are much more active than others. Uh, judicial independence. Uh, so to ensure the rule of law is upheld, the judicial system should be independent of government and other influences. To protect independent judges in many constitutional democracies are given a high level of job security. So it can be extremely difficult to remove them. Um, there'll be sometimes kind of a formal process for review for removing them, but a very, very difficult one to achieve. Um, so typically, um, once a judge is selected, um, particularly to the highest courts, um, pretty much the only way they get removed is um, retirement, or in some case, yeah, countries, there'll be kind of a time period where they can serve. So when that time period's up, so maybe they're given a 10 year term, um, but within that 10 years, it could be very, very, very difficult to remove them. Uh, judges are expected to refrain from political activity once appointed to the bench. Um, so. Um, not only should they be kind of uh, independent from the different um, uh, to or to kind of help maintain that they are independent and to try to avoid any sense of bias. Um, judges are supposed to kind of refrain from being involved in any actions that could be viewed as political. So participation in political parties, campaigning, um, discussing politics or political views. Um, any of these activities could create the appearance that they're politically motivated in their judicial rulings, which would harm kind of the, the perceptions of the court. We want the court, ideally, we want the perception that the courts are fully independent, are fully neutral, um, that they're making decisions um, based on the facts. Um, we have enough politics with legislative and executive branches. When it comes to the courts, we want the idea that um, no matter who's in power, they'll apply the same laws um, fairly um, and without bias. Um, and so anything that could damage that is viewed as, as problematic. The selection of judges can be controversial. 
um, because government leaders tend to select judges who share their ideological perspective. Um, so obviously when um, selecting judges, you're going to select judges based on their merits, but also you're going to pick, you know, there's a lot of judges with merits. You're going to pick those who you think are going to rule um, in a, in a way favorably to you. So who have a, a similar interpretation of the constitution to you. Um, so in terms of what is allowed and what's not allowed. Supreme Court of Canada judges are appointed on the recommendation of the cabinet, although in practice, the choice is made by the prime minister. There'll often be recommendations from outside the cabinet who come in from the bar associations and whatnot as to candidates. So they'll submit in files, cabinet will review it, make recommendations and the prime minister will make the choice. So Canada has a unified court system. Uh, so that means it's fully hierarchical. So there's not kind of independent. Uh, so in the state, for example, they've got a separate federal courts and state courts. Uh, in Canada, we don't have this kind of level of separation. Um, Canada has a mix of common law and uh, codified law or civil law. Uh, so common law at the federal and um, uh, is applied at the federal level and uh, in provinces other than Quebec. And then civil law is applied within Quebec. Um, so common law consists of court judgments uh, that have accumulated over many centuries. Uh, so used in England and most of the former British colonies. Um, so um, it, one of the factors in interpreting law is based on precedent. So previous judicial decisions are used in uh, making future judicial decisions. So if the Supreme Court in the past has made a ruling on, on a particular issue, um, and um, a, a, another court in the future is dealing with that particular issue, their, their starting point isn't, um, um, isn't zero. They have to include as a factor in their decision this previous, um, uh, this previous precedent, this previous decision made by the Supreme Court or by a higher court or by another court. Um, in factor in the decision. So that has an influence. So you have to look at, courts have to look at past precedent in this particular issue in making their decision. Codified or civil law involves the adoption of comprehensive system of principles that judges use to determine the outcome of a particular case. It's used in most countries in continental Europe, Latin America, and in Quebec. Um, so this is based not on past decisions, but on a set of principles that judges use to determine the, the outcome. And in any given case, it's not necessarily looking at past judgments, but fully at these principles for making the decisions. All right, that's all for today. Um, wishing you all a great weekend and a restful um, student uh, wellness week, or I guess, Sage Up Wellness Week. <laughs>